Okay. Oh. Right, so uh, this revision seminar for Mass 1b, and it's on um, infinite series. And um, I thought I'd start. I mean, I'm not going to teach it in the order that it was in the in the course because that's not the order that you should remember anything. So sometimes you have to learn things in a certain order so that it connects up with stuff you already know. Um, but when you're revising it, you want it in a slightly different order. Uh, so I'm going to put it in the order that I think that makes sense to me. Um, and I apologise to those who are listening. Um, I am making this up as I go today because it was a request session. So we'll see how it turns out. OK. Uh, so the big idea in, in infinite series Uh, is that polynomials are the best sort of function because they're easy to calculate, uh, they're easy to differentiate, they're easy to integrate, they're easy to write down. And we can represent them inside a computer with just a string of coefficients. It's all lovely. Um, <coughs> and um, we know a lot about how polynomials behave. So when we see a polynomial function, like 1 plus x plus x squared, um, we can very easily figure out what it ought to look like. It's quadratic, it has a certain expected shape. Um, and so if we can write everything in terms of polynomials, um, then life will be easier. And so the purpose of Taylor series and Maclaurin series is to do that. Uh, and however, some functions aren't polynomials, like sine, for example isn't a polynomial. E to the x is totally not a polynomial. Um, and so if we want to represent it as a polynomial, we're going to have to use infinitely many. So instead of just 1 plus x plus x squared, we're going to have to have an x cubed and an x to the 4 and, a, and forever to try and figure out what this is. OK, that's the concept. So um, right. So uh, some functions can be represented as infinite series. Um, and so a decent little description um, foray into infinite series as objects in their own right, how do they behave, is a good thing to do before we want to represent other things using them. It's a little bit like when you first learn complex numbers, you spend quite a long time trying to figure out the multiple ways of representing them and how they work as objects in their own right before you start using them to do anything really useful. And you still, in Mass 1b, haven't found out how to use them for anything really useful yet. Not even in the mathematical sense of making more maths with them. Uh, so, um, and same with fractions. We learn to represent fractions in multiple different ways and we spend a lot of time learning how to add them and subtract them and stuff before we got a good handle on using them to do stuff. Uh, so it's the same deal. We're going to say infinite series, what are they and what can we do with them? So this is the general way of writing one down. This is called a power series, this one. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to look like that. Um, it could just be, I'm going to rub out the x here. This is a power series and this is a polynomial like I was talking about. But it doesn't necessarily have to have an x in it at all. It could just be this. And what that means is, you know, a0 and a1 and a2 and a3 and on forever. That's what that means. Now that's actually technically not a formal mathematical def definition because what on earth does it mean to add something forever? Um, and so the technical definition is that that infinite sum is the limit of a finite sum um, as the, the number of terms goes to infinity. Um, but I don't think that's actually a necessary part of Mass 1b at this point. But that's the definition. So I'll just put it in brackets. You know, the proper definition is that it's this. So it's the 
the limit as n goes to infinity of a1 up to a n. And so you basically say, well, I can figure out a formula for what it adds up to if I use capital N of these terms. And that formula, if I do the limit of that formula as capital N goes to infinity, if that limit exists, then that's what the infinite sum works out to be. So the idea behind it is that you just keep adding an extra term and an extra term and you keep going until you can be sure that if you went forever it would come to some sort of limit. Okay, so technically infinite series are all about limits, um, but that's hardly surprising because pretty much everything in calculus is ultimately about limits. Okay, but that's the definition, but that's not the important bit. Um, the important bit and is how to recognise um, whether your infinite series is useful or not. Okay, so an infinite series is totally something that you can write down. Okay, you can write down an expression like this with whatever formula here. This a n is a formula in terms of n um, or i. Um, whatever formula you like in this spot, and it will be a perfectly reasonable thing to write on the page. Um, but your question is, well, if you write that, is it meaningful in terms of a number? Um, and so we've got this, now we've got this object, which is just a, a formal written statement on a piece of paper, and we can do stuff with it. And sometimes it represents a number and sometimes it doesn't. And that's going to be really important for us to be able to um, use them in order to represent functions. Uh, and so the, this definition is a literal definition of what it means. But the best plan is really to just get used to things that do work and things that don't. Um, and so the word for actually existing as a proper number is called converging. Okay, so um, the series is said to converge if If the sum comes to a number. Now that's not the formal definition of converging. The formal definition of converging is that this limit exists. Okay, but this is the best way of, of thinking about it. The sum comes to a number, so it actually means a proper number. Um, and so uh, we want to know which sorts of series converge and which sorts of series don't. And so what we have is a nice list of tests for convergence. Okay, so these are our tests for convergence. The first test for convergence is to just have a list of series that you're allowed to look at them and just know whether they converge or not. And this is where we get into what we mentioned earlier about um, numbers, uh, not numbers, about remembering stuff. So, so there's a list of ones that we're just going to have to remember so that when we look at them and go, no, that converges totally, definitely converges. Um, and so we are going to have a list of those and the first one, so our first um, test, test zero as it were, is, um, is to have some known series. Okay, so the first known series is called the harmonic series. And the harmonic series is extremely famous. It doesn't start at zero, it starts at one. And it looks like that. Technically anything that has something linear on the bottom um, will, is also harmonic. Um, and the harmonic series diverges, which is the opposite of converging. It doesn't exist. Okay, so the series, I can write it down, but if I attempt to do it forever, it will not come to an answer. It will just, if I keep adding an extra one on n, you know, you've got a one plus a half plus a quarter, a third plus a quarter plus a fifth, if I keep adding on extra ones, it'll just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It'll do it extremely slowly, but it'll do it eventually. And so this diverges. And then the next um, known series is the alternating harmonic.
Uh, sometimes you'll see it with an n plus 1 up there in the power. Doesn't really matter. As long as um, the minus 1, it switches from plus 1 to minus 1 as you go, it doesn't matter. It's still one of the alternating harmonic series. And the alternating harmonic series converges. So anytime you see them, if something works out to be the harmonic series, you are allowed to say this diverges because it's the harmonic series and that's it. You don't have to prove it, it's just the truth. Um, and the same with the alternating harmonic. You say that's the alternating harmonic, it converges. And there are a few others that you're allowed to just say. So the next type of classic series is the geometric series. I say the geometric series, but there's a whole host of them. A geometric series is one that can be rewritten to look like this. I put that in brackets for a reason. So a geometric series, you can rewrite it to have something to the power of n. And that something is usually called x, but often it will be some sort of formula inside that bracket. So if you can rewrite it like that, it doesn't have to start at n equals 0 in order to know whether it converges. Um, but it does have to start at zero for you to know what it adds up to. So um, the geometric series, um, if the size of what's inside that bracket, the absolute value, is less than one, then it converges. And if the size of what's in brackets is greater than or equal to one, then it diverges. So that means there's actually two different kinds of geometric series. There are the ones that when you write it down, the number inside the brackets is um, more than one, uh, and they don't actually exist. So you can perfectly write it down, but they don't represent numbers. Um, and the ones where the number inside is less than one, um, or the absolute value is less than one, um, then they converge. And they do represent numbers, and this is one of the few things that we actually know what the answer is. The answer is this. I'll give an example of figuring that out at some point. Okay, so note here that the alternating harmonic series converges, but you haven't been told what it converges to. I'm pretty sure it converges to like ln2 or something like that, but I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. Um, but yes, the alternating series does actually converge, but you haven't been told what number it converges to. Geometric series when it converges, you actually have a formula that tells you what it converges to, what the actual answer is. And that's quite rare with infinite series. Okay, if you just pick a random infinite series with just some random expression next to that sum sign, it will be almost impossible to tell what it actually converges to just by doing a formula. So if your lecturer says, find the sum, these infinite sums, you can almost always guarantee that that's because they're geometric series because we don't know how to find them in any other way, at least not in Maths 1B. Okay, and there are a couple of others that you are supposed to just know um, because of other information. Um, there's ones that are called P-series. Pretty sure that's what they're called. Just give me a second to look that up. Yeah, I just had to look up the right terminology from the lectures. It's called a P-series. could spell series right. A P series is what I call a power of the harmonic series. Okay, so if you have something that looks like the harmonic series but it's a power instead, something like that, 1 over n to the power of p. It's a power of the harmonic series. Um, this will converge depending on what p is. So you have something like 1 over n squared, which will converge. Uh, 1 over n to the half won't. And so depending on the value of p, it will converge or not. So if, um, if p is less than um, or equal to 1, it diverges. And if P is greater than 1, it converges. So just so that you've seen a proper example of that, 
rather than a, just a formula. So for example, uh, 1 over n cubed, 1 over n squared, 1 over n to the 3 on 2, they all converge because the power is more than 1. But 1 over n, we already covered that one. 1 over n to the half. They, you know, and 1 over n, you know, anything. You know, to the 3 quarters. Um, they all diverge. Okay, so if the power is less than 1, it diverges, if the power is more than one, it converges. And that's one of the ones that you're allowed to just say. If you see it, you can go, it's 1 over n squared, converges. I believe that the 1 over n squared converges to pi squared on 6. Um, but I'm also making that up, so please don't quote me on that. Um, okay, so we've covered so far on our list of things that we're supposed to just know, the harmonic series and its powers, um, the alternating harmonic, the geometric series, and there are just a couple more that we should be able to just recognise off the top of our head. And they um, come from um, Taylor series. Okay, so there's a couple of... And, and Taylor series are a specific way of getting an, a, a, a function and rewriting it in terms of an infinite series. If, you have, if you're revising Maths 1B after do, doing it, you should know this by now, um, but if you're using this seminar to study Maths 1B for the first time, it's coming soon. <laughs> Um, so, um, when you do um, Taylor series um, or Maclaurin series, there's a couple of them that you're expected to just know and you can just stare at them and go, cool, that's the answer. And so we have the Maclaurin series. Okay, so we have some Maclaurin series. Um, so we have e to the x. So if you see the sum of 1 over n factorial, you know it's e to the 1. Okay, because it's 1 to every power. Okay, so if you see something with just a plain number on the top, if you see something like 2 to the n over n factorial, it's e squared. Okay, so you were allowed to just say that, you know. Okay, because it's a Maclaurin series. Unless, of course, they specifically ask you to prove it, and then you have to do Taylor series or something. Um, but those are sort of things that you're supposed to just know. Um, and I believe you're supposed to, I'm not sure 100% about whether you're supposed to remember the sine and cos Taylor series, um, but it is actually possible to remember them. So I'm just going to write them in here anyway. Um, but past lecturers, depends on the lecturer. Some lecturers expect you to remember it and some lecturers don't. But certainly, second year engineering maths lecturers totally expect you to know them. Um, so it's good to start now. Um, so, sine x, the way that I remember what sine x is one is, is it's an odd function, so it only uses odd powers. Okay, that's the first thing that helps me remember it. So, um, and it uses the same powers that e to the x does, but it only, use the, only uses the odd ones. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put in, instead of n, we're going to put in 2n plus 1 so that it comes out to be odd. Okay, so so far it's just the odd powers from e to the x. But the problem with sine is we need an extra bit and we need a minus 1 to the power of something as well. So it's going to have to have a minus 1 to the power of something um, and that something is not 2 to the n plus 1 because that would be pointless because minus 1 to an odd power is always minus 1. It's <coughs> n. And you can check if you've done this right. You know it's right because you've only got the odd powers from e to the x. And you can check if your minus 1 is correct because you know that the first one should be positive uh, because sine x is almost equal to x. So you want the first one to be x because sine x over x equals 1. OK, 
Okay, so it always has to start with a positive one. So when n is 0, it'll come out. When n is 0, um, let's have a look. When n is 0, we're going to get minus 1 to the 0, which is 1, x to the 0 plus 1, so x divided by 1 factorial. So we're just going to get an x to start with. And that's the correct one that's supposed to be. And then the next one is x cubed on 3 factorial and x to the 5 on 5 factorial and x to the 7 on 7 factorial. Only they'll switch signs as they go. That is the Taylor series, the Maclaurin series for sine x. I should point out that if you just ignored this minus 1 to the n, it would be shine, as in hyperbolic sine. So um, that's another one that you can remember as well if you want to, but it's not necessary, um, not at this stage. But yes, the one where they're all positive is shine x. And cos x is the same, but it only has the even powers. So cos x... is exactly the same, but instead of having 2n plus 1, it just has 2n. So you can construct it straight up. You can say, well, I know it has the even powers, so I'll put 2n to make it even, and I know it switches between plus and minus. Um, and so what this means is it'll start at 1, because that's x to the 0, and it will go x squared on 2 factorial, x to the 4 on 4 factorial, x to the 6 on 6 factorial, and it will switch plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on. That is, um, whoa, that 4 is crap. Um, still not that much better, but it'll do. Uh, so cos x has the um, even powers from e to the x, but it switches between plus and minus. And again, if they're all positive, it's actually cosh. And there is one more series that you're expected to just know. I'm really not sure about this. I mean, even when I was in first year, it sort of wasn't examinable. But they do mention it, and so it's worth mentioning now. It's the binomial series, they call it. Um, so I'm going to put it on this list just so that you can, you know, because it is not, un, not unheard of for them to say, using the binomial series, blah, 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 okay, and you're allowed to just write down the answer. So the binomial series is a specific kind of, um, is a specific kind of um, Taylor series. Um, it's a Maclaurin series as well. Um, and the function that it works out to is 1 plus x to the n to the m. I'm just going to look it up just to make sure that I'm using the right terminology. Okay, so 1 plus x to some power, and it doesn't matter what that power is. It doesn't have to be a whole number. It can be a fraction as well. Uh, 1 plus x to the m is 1, always starts at 1. So I'm not going to write this down as a, with a sum sign, because people don't. They just write it down with the dots. Okay, so um, 1... Actually, I might leave a gap for the sum sign just in case because I'm pretty sure I can remember it. No, I'll leave. It doesn't matter. Change my mind. 1 plus m choose 1 x plus m choose 2 x squared plus and so on. That's the binomial series. Now, the thing is that we have to have a new definition of what choose means in order for this to work. And that's the thing that makes the binomial series confusing. And so I might as well write it down as an infinite series. I mean, that's what it is. OK, so this series, um, the thing that makes it tricky is that it's not so much that you're going to be looking at this one and noticing that that's what it is, it's more the other way. 
but it's good to know that they work both ways. So, um, I just want to point out that this will only work if you redefine what M choose N means. Okay, so um, the definition goes like this. M choose zero is always one no matter what M is. Sweet. Okay. Um, and you're only allowed to have a whole number at the bottom. That's fine because it, ma it matches with what power of X we're up to. Um, and then the, heart, the, the um, number at the um, top can be any number. And what you do is this. So I just need to do an example. So M choose one is always just M, M choose 2, 1 times 2 on the bottom, and M times M minus 1 on the top. And M choose 3 has 1 times 2 times 3 on the bottom, and M times M minus 1 times M minus 2 on the top. And the pattern continues. So basically what you do is you do 1 times 2 times 3 times up to whatever the number on the bottom is, and on the top you start at M and you work your way down instead. And this works even if M is a whole number and it's a much more efficient way of calculating it than with the factorials. Um, but it works also if it's a, um, if it's a fraction. Okay? So that is the binomial series. So, you know, etc. Right, so these are all of the ones that either in the you see the series and you just know what it adds up to and whether it adds up. Um, or you see, you see um, the function and you want to turn it into a series. So they work both ways. And it might not have been the best idea to do this now, but you know, I'm organising it in this order at the moment. Um, I should say that it only converges um, the same as for um, the geometric series. So if this is less than 1, it converges. And uh, if it's um, greater than one, it will diverge. I'm just thinking about that. Conceivably, I think if it's equal to one, it will diverge as well. I mean, this totally exists when x is equal to one, but that's not the point. It's if this is exists. Um, but if, if m is equal to 1, we'll just get 1 plus x plus x squared plus whatever. Um, sorry, if x is equal to 1, <laughs> um, we'll get m choose 1, m choose 1. It'll just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yep. So I think that it's the same. It's the same as for the um, geometric series. And in fact, the geometric series is one of these binomial series. Because what you do is you replace x with minus x, and the m is minus 1, and you get 1 over 1 minus x. And so the geometric series is, is one of the versions of the binomial series. And that's a classic tute question, like, like assignment written question. To, uh, it doesn't usually happen in an exam. Um, but it's a classic maths 1b assignment question to, to get you to con notice that connection. I think it's one of the Maple TAs, actually. Um, you do something like that, and it turns out to be the, the um, 1 over 1 minus x. Okay, so let's just see where I've got. Um, I've got my, so far I've just got a list of known series. Now some of them, the first several um, on this first page, these are the ones that will come up if you've got, just got a random series with an infinite sum, and these are the ones that are likely to just appear at some point, and you'll go, Oh, okay, cool. I know what that is. It's a geometric series. The x is less than 1. Totally converges. Um, on my second page, these are Maclaurin series that you're supposed to know. And it more works in the other direction, where you can just go, here's a function, and this is, it. This is a, an infinite series that happens to come out to that. Though in some rare cases, you will see something that looks like this, You'll see 2 to the n over n factorial, and you're allowed to say that converges because it's, because it's the Maclaurin series for e to the x when x is 2. So 
Yes, there you go. So these are all the series that we have to just know, um, Maclaurin series or just random series. Okay, so before I move on from that, I'm going to just have a quick look at um, geometric series as some examples of how to deal with them um, before I move on to the other um, tests for convergence. So, um, so your classic question um, that goes with um, geometric series is something along the lines of um, decide if these series converge and if so tell me what they add up to yeah so So decide if that series converges and find the sum if it does. Now normally in an assignment it will have like part A, part B, part C. It will say decide if these series converge and find the sum if they do. Um, but I'm only going to do one of them. Um, so you can guess because there's only one that it will actually converge. Because um, <laughs> otherwise what's the point of asking the question? Uh, but sometimes it won't. So one of the clues um, for this one, for knowing that it's in the category that we've already got in this known series category, is we look at it and we say, actually, interestingly, it's number to the power of n. Like a number to the power of stuff with n's in it. Okay, it doesn't have anything other than numbers to powers. Okay, so your harmonic series has the n all by itself. It's not part of the power in the harmonic series. Your harmonic series has an n here, so, um, and this one has an n to a power. They're not, the power, the unknown, the n, is not in the power in these ones here. The only one of my known series where the n is in the power is this. And in fact, the n is only in the power. So if you look at a series and you, and you notice that all of the n's are in the power, it's a good chance that it's actually a geometric series. So that's your first clue. And so what we need to do is we need to attempt to rewrite it as something to the power of n. So I'm going to do this first. I'm not going to do it with the sum sign because I don't want to keep writing my sigma over and over. So I'm just going to take the, the individual terms and I'm going to rewrite them so that there's something to the power of n or at least close enough. So let's have a look at this. The 3 to the 2n can be rewritten as 3 squared to the n. Like that. So this has already been written as something to the power of n. The 2 to the n plus 1, not nearly as easy, but I can at least remove the 1 by doing this. That's the same as 2 to the n times 2 to the 1. Because plus up in the powers is times down below. Okay, doing well. So that 2, that's 2 to the 1, I'm gonna, that's going to be left all by itself. So I'll pull that out the front. And what I have left is 2 to the n, 3 squared to the n. They both have an power of n, and powers can be brought out over division. And we have that. So since they both have a power of n, it can be brought out. And we have this. So now we have... this. So you'll notice that we've rewritten it as number times number to the power of n. And so we can have our, um, our geometric series now. So this original series that we had is actually the same as this. And if we're very clever, well, we can just pull the two out the front. So this bit here is a geometric series 
and the x that's inside this bracket here is less than 1, and so therefore it converges. So we can say... So the fact that it starts at 3 is irrelevant to whether it converges or not. Okay, so where it starts, this one starts at 3, um, that's irrelevant to the fact that it converges. Um, it's all to do with what's next to here, where it starts. Because converging is all about what happens when we get further out, closer and when we get closer and closer and closer in inverted commas to infinity, that's what convergence is about. So convergence it doesn't matter of what happens at the beginning. Um, but it does make a difference to what it adds up to. So, if all they asked was, does it converge? Well, I've got that, because I've converted it to a geometric series and the bit inside the brackets is less than 1. However, we need to know what it adds up to. And the problem is that the formula for what a geometric series adds up to only works when the n is 0. So, when the n is 0, um, we know that it will be 1 over 1 minus x, but the n isn't 0, it's 3, so we're going to have to shift it over so that it is 0. So we're going to do that clever trick. So, we had an n here. And we want this n to be 0, so we're going to have to subtract 3 from the numbers here. So my n equals 3 is going to have to come down to 0, my n equals 4 is going to have to come down to 1. Infinity is still going to be infinity, because infinity minus 3 is still infinity. So I have to subtract 3 here, which means I need to add 3 here. So when you subtract something from the numbers in the sum, um, you have to add 3 to all of the n's that appear in the formula. So be careful when you do this trick. If there's more than one n, you have to add it to all of them. Um, and if it says 2n, then you would have to actually go 2 brackets n plus 3. So you need to put it right next to where the n is. So this is going to go down 3, and this is going to go up 3. And then we're going to do one more clever trick, because we still can't use it at the moment, because we've made the sum start at the right spot, but now it's got an n plus 3 instead of a plain n. So we still can't use our geometric series formula. So we're going to have to do this. Like that. And now we can bring this all the way out the front. And now we've finally written in a form that allows us um, to actually do the calculation because now it's got the n equals 0 here and it's got number to the n here. So that is your standard um, geometric series. And so the answer to the bit that's the infinite sum will be 1 over 1 minus x. Not pretty, but there it is. Um, if you want to make it look less um, horrifying, because most people, mathematicians included, do not like fractions within fractions, I find the easiest way of dealing with a fraction within a fraction is to... Mul I know that if I multiplied this 2 ninths by 9, I would get a number, 2. So if I multiply the top by 9 and the bottom by 9, it will make the fraction within a fraction go away. Like that. So I multiplied the top by 9 and the bottom by 9, um, and so we get something that's not too bad. So the 2 times 9 would be 18. And that would be, and that's close enough. I wouldn't do anything more than that. It's, it's, it's good enough. You could technically figure out what 9 cubed is, but really, do you want to? And the answer is no. Um, so that's pretty close. But um, it's usually bad practice to leave a fraction within a fraction. Most mathematicians don't like that. So good to just multiply the top and bottom by the denominator of the bottom. And I find that the quickest way of dealing with that. Um, some people will try and put this over a common denominator and, and then flip it over, but there's so many places you could go wrong with that that I quite like this version better.
Okay, so that's actually finding one and figuring it out. If, of course, at this stage when you had it, it came out as, say, 9 over 2, you would say, well, it's geometric with the inside greater than 1, so it diverges and you'd stop. Okay, so that's an example of using geometric series to tell if things converge. And then there are three or four tests for convergence. And the tests for convergence go like this. The next test for convergence is... So I'm just going to return to... That's all right. The next test for convergence um, is the, what I call the test for divergence. So if you look in your textbook um, to find tests for convergence, it will have one that's named in your textbook that was not explicitly given a name in your lecture notes. Um, but it's still expected for you to know how to use it even if you don't have a name for it. So I just call it the... test for divergence. So the test for divergence goes, if you have an infinite sum like this, if the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is not zero, then it diverges. In your notes, this is listed as if it converges, then the limit of the individual terms is zero. Mm -hmm. If it converges, then the limit of the individual terms is zero. The problem with that version is that lots of people think that all they have to do is to check if the individual terms are zero and then it converges, and that's not true. Okay? Um, what this test is telling you is that what you do is you check if the individual terms go to zero and if they don't, then it diverges. If it does come to zero, then it doesn't tell you anything. Okay? So I'll just point that out. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is zero, this tells you nothing. Okay, so that's the test for divergence. Um, and I should do an example of that. So your classic test for divergence happens um, if you have an expression um, where a n is, where the, number, the sort of total power of n on the top and the total power of n on the bottom are the same. Oh, this could start at zero. It doesn't actually matter what number it starts at. Um, maybe something like that. n squared plus 3n over n plus 1 all squared. So my clue that this is a test to see if the individual terms go to zero situation is to see how the powers match up, okay? So the fact that the top has got an n squared and the bottom, if I expanded it out, would also have an n squared is telling me that, that this is not going to come to zero. Um, and so I don't need to do, use any of the other fancy tests. Pardon me. Um, it's totally not any of the normal series that I'm looking for. It doesn't have a factorial in it. It's not 1 over n. So I can't use any of my classic series, which is the first thing to try. And the next thing is to think, do the individual terms go to zero? And so I could say, well, the limit as n goes to infinity of the individual terms, I'm not dividing them by anything, I'm just doing it straight up. Um, and when you do a limit as, n goes, as something goes to infinity, the traditional way of dealing with it is to divide the top and bottom by the biggest power of n that you see. So we'll divide by n squared. Okay, so I divided the top and bottom by n squared. And the n squared can come inside the brackets. 
And so I end up with one, I end up with that. So it's not, um, just for future reference, it's not actually necessary to expand out the bottom um, because if this is going to work, it should be, f you should be able to bring it inside. Of course, if the top has a bigger power than the bottom, then um, the limit will be, won't be exist at all. And so, as n goes to infinity, 3 on n goes to 0, and 1 on n goes to 0, and so I get 1 over 1 squared, which is 1, which is not 0, and so it diverges. So, it do the limit doesn't have to not exist. Um, some people have this belief that it should come out to infinity, but it just has to come out to anything other than 0. So that's your classic double bluff. Don't attempt to do any of the fancier tests. Um, I mean, first check to see if it's just 1 over n squared or something, but um, don't attempt to do any of the fancier tests. Um, just see if the limit comes out to 0. OK. The next test is called the alternating series test. Oh, I should say that if you have factorials in the expression, it'll almost always converge. So this is, don't, if there's factorials there, don't try and do this test for divergence. Yeah, no, don't. <laughs> okay, so the alternating series test, you start with the test for divergence, and you do that first. And if it comes out to be zero, um, then you check if it's an alternating series. Okay, so the alternating series is specifically for series that involve a minus 1 to the n in one of their terms. So basically you've got something like this. But your a n is really minus 1 to the n times something else. Okay. The reason I haven't written it as minus 1 to the n a n is that traditionally a n represents the entire thing that is there. Okay, so I've just said that it's possible to look at this and pick out a minus 1 to the n. You don't need to be able to rewrite it um, technically, you just have to stare at it and go, oh, there's a minus 1 to the n there. It's an alternating series. Okay, so if you see a minus 1 to the n, that's when you should start going, ooh, alternating series, cool. First, when you do the alternating series, you first have to do the divergence test. Okay, so first, so the alternating series test um, has three parts. So part one is check it is alternating, meaning it includes a minus one to the n. And you've done that before you even started the test, so, but that's technically step zero, I suppose. Step zero. Step one is check that the individual terms go to zero. Okay, so that's the other way of writing it. You don't have to write it as a limit. And step two is check that at some point, it doesn't have to start this way, but at some point, at some place, as with, with some n, every n after that, the, series, the, the individual terms are strictly decreasing in size. So check that at some point, Okay, that the, the, the absolute value of an is more than the absolute value of an plus 1, which is more than the absolute value of an plus 2. The terms have to be strictly decreasing in size as they go. It is extremely difficult to come up with um, an alternating series that does not do that third, that's check number 2. Okay, that is extremely hard to think of. Okay, so it is almost never a problem, that second one, but you do have to, if you use the alternating series test in an exam, you have to explicitly state that bit, because they're looking for it. You won't get the full marks if you don't.
Okay, so an example of using that, just to show you what the working looks like. something like that, minus 1 to the n over 3n plus 2. It's very close to being the alternating harmonic series. Okay, if it was just minus 1 to the n over 3n, I'd pull the, three out, the third out the front and say it's the alternating harmonic series, yay! Okay, but because of the plus 2, that's causing me some pain, so the alternating series test is the go. So, step 0 is check that it's an alternating, that it is alternating, so we'll put that down. And you can just say that. Step number one, check that the individual terms go to zero. So we can have that minus one to the n over three n plus two totally goes to zero as n goes to infinity because, um, well, the bottom goes to infinity. Three times infinity plus two is still infinity. Um, but you could write it as a limit if you like. You could write it as the limit as n goes to infinity of that equals zero. So either option, they're both fine. Okay, it may be necessary for you to actually calculate that limit um, in more rigorously than just stating it, but in this situation since the bottom is, you know, you'll divide the top and bottom by n and you'll get zero over, n, over three. So, And number two, Check that at some n it's strictly decreasing. Um, and so we want the absolute value, which means we're ignoring the minus 1 to the n. Um, and you could have put that back here too if you wanted the absolute value of n goes to 0. Actually, you know what? That's much simpler. Just a second. So the limit as n goes to infinity of everything except the minus 1 to the n. See, that's, that's my working is much easier then. Okay, say so vital milliseconds by not writing down the minus and the power of n and the brackets. Um, and then the last thing is that this thing here without the minus 1 is supposed to get smaller and smaller as n gets bigger, which it does. And so you just have to state it. You don't have to prove it, um, usually. So, um, For all n, that is strictly decreasing as n increases. And so you can say, therefore, converges by the alternating series test. Okay, but you have to state all three of those things to be allowed to use the alternating series test. You have to say it's the, an alternating series you have to check that the individual terms go to zero and you have to say that it's strictly decreasing at some point. It doesn't have to be strictly decreasing to begin with, just at some point later on. But usually it is strictly decreasing straight up. Okay, that's the alternating series test. And then the last um, test for convergence um, is when you uh, use, it's called the ratio test. And the ratio test is basically comparing your series to a geometric series. When I was in first year, we learned a whole lot of other um, interesting tests as well. Um, and if you do ever do real analysis in the future, um, you will learn any number of interesting um, tests for convergence. But in Maths 1B, there's only these ones. So. Uh, just to let you know if you're ever going to do more maths that there might be more. So the last one is called the ratio test. So, so far our tests have really been quite straightforward. We're just looking at them going, oh well, look, duh. Okay, so it's been, it's been, um, it's a geometric series and we know how they work. Or, um, oh look, the terms don't go to zero, doesn't converge. 
So for the ratio test, we actually have to perform a calculation first and then we'll know whether it converges or not. And the calculation we're going to perform is pretty much trying to compare our um, series to wh what it would be if it was a geometric series. Um, so the ratio test goes like this. You've got a series like this. It doesn't have to start at 1, it could start anywhere. And you will calculate, you will calculate each term divided by the one um, before it. Okay? So I like to do it this way. We'll, step one is we calculate an plus one over an. And then we calculate the limit of that we calculate the limit as n goes to infinity of that answer that we just calculated. And that limit we will give the name L. Okay? So we have if L is less than 1 then it will converge. What that means is, well, if you look at it, an plus 1 over an is each um, is a term divided by the one before it. So if, if you get a term and you divide the one before it and you get an answer less than 1, that means the term is a little bit smaller than it was before. Um, and so the concept is that if your answer comes out to less than 1, then over there at infinity, when you go far enough out, um, then each term is smaller than the one before, so the terms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you add the terms on, and you keep adding on smaller and smaller and smaller terms, um, it won't get to infinity, you'll get to a number. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. And also, if this was a geometric series, um, then a geometric series is a power, um, and so that means that each term divided by the one before it will always come to the same answer if it's a geometric series. So in a geometric series, each term divided by the one before is always the same answer, um, and geometric series is, will always converge as long as um, that answer is less than 1 because that's the x that we were looking for before. So it's all comparing to how a geometric series works. Um, but if it comes out to more than 1, it diverges. But if L is equal to 1, then um, the test tells us nothing. Now, if this does come out to be equal to 1, the likelihood is that what you should have done to begin with is a divi divergence test, where you just found the limit of the individual terms themselves. Okay, So that's why you should always try the divergence test first, um, because um, if you, it's much easier than the... Uh, you should look to see if the individual terms don't, uh, go, don't go to 0, because if they don't, then um, you it would have been a waste of time doing the ratio test. Okay, so the ratio test has the tendency to come out to 1 if the individual terms don't go to 0. Um, and so, uh, therefore, you, that's why we list the divergence test first. So, yeah, some people who try the ratio test on a question like this one will be sorely disappointed because the limit will come out to be precisely 1, which is sad. Okay. And that's the ratio test. So, just as an example of a ratio test, yeah, I'm going to leave it like that. So we have n plus 3 on n squared plus 1. Let's do that one and see how it turns out. So this, um, let's just first check. Individual terms, the bottom has a bigger power than the top, so they are going to go to 0. Okay, so we should just say that aloud first before we move on. 
because if the bottom and the top had, had if the if the bottom and the top had the same power of n, um, then it wouldn't have converged because the limit of the individual terms would have been not zero. So we're all good with that. The bottom um, is a bigger power than the top, so that they do go to zero. So the ratio test is our next try. So just um, in brackets, um, if you don't put this in your working. So a n does go to zero. Okay, so that's our first check just to make sure that we, w we weren't wasting our time by doing the ratio test. So it's not a waste of time, so we're going to do the ratio test. So let's see, a n plus one over a n. I should also point out that if this had been minus one to the n in front of that there, alternating series test would have done it. We wouldn't need to do the ratio test. Okay, so a minus one to the n in that spot um, you go, well, bottom's big in the top, terms go to zero, um, they're strictly decreasing, ratio test, um, alternating series test, sweet. So, good to check the other rules first. So, a n plus, well, we know what a n is. It's n plus 3 over n squared plus 1. And we know what n plus... And, and what we have to do now for the an plus 1 is to put n plus 1 everywhere there's an n in this formula. So we have an n plus 3, so that becomes an n plus 1 plus 3. And we have an n squared plus 1, so that becomes an n plus 1 squared plus 1. My pencil's almost gone. So good thing I have another one. So that's where we are with that. So, uh, when you divide by a fraction, it's the same as multiplying by the fraction the other way up. Okay. So we have that times n squared plus 1 n plus 3. So my bottom has flipped up to become this, and I might as well just figure out what this is. It's the n plus 4. Now look closely, look very closely at this limit. Um, the power on the top of that fraction is n cubed, and so is the power on the bottom. So um, unfortunately, the ratio test is going to come out to 1 not going to tell us anything useful at all. Curses. So I should point out that all of these numbers are positive because n is a positive number. So at this stage I can actually remove the absolute value signs because everything's positive anyway. Um, and it just makes my working easier. So the limit of an plus 1 over an is the limit as n goes to infinity of this. Um, and so what I should do is I should divide the top and bottom by the biggest power of n that I see. Um, and n cubed is actually the biggest power. And so if I divide the top by n cubed, if I divide this one by n and this one by n squared, that would be n cubed in total. So I can just do it one part at a time. These both have an n squared, and I can divide them by n squared. And these both have an n, and I can divide them by n. And I can see what I get. So this one divided by n is this. And this one divided by n is this. This one divided by n squared is this. And this one divided by n squared, um, we'll get a 1 on n squared here. And then the n squared will come inside that square to become an n, and we'll get 1 plus 1 on n there. And so we're going to get 1, 1, 1, we're going to get 1. 
So the ratio test tells me nothing. Curses. Um, Okay, so it is okay um, to just leave it at that in your exam, okay? Because you haven't actually been told how to deal with this situation, right? Um, sorry? No, but well, this is there is a more appropriate test, but you haven't learned it, so this is the best that we can do. Um, actually, if you watch very closely. Um, this one is not going to converge because it's approximately equal to the harmonic series when it's out at infinity. Because you've got, when n, is, when n is infinity, n plus 3 is approximately the same as n. When n is infinity, when n is like huge, n squared plus 1 is approximately the same as n squared. So what we have here is approximately equal to 1 over n, which is the harmonic series which diverges. Um, so actually it diverges, but you haven't been told how to do that reasoning. Um, and so yeah, if you did it in your exam, the person would be most impressed. Um, but I would, I would argue um, that the people in your exam would not give you one that will come out to one. <laughs> Unless they specifically said, use the ratio test, because then you could say the ratio test is inconclusive. Um, yeah. But all the same, if that happens and it comes out to one, you're allowed to just say inconclusive and stop. I will do one that, that actually does work. <laughs> The ratio test is particularly good for things with powers where the n is in the power and things with factorials. Okay, so I'll do one with the power and, and I'll do the factorial in something else. But something like something like that. So two to the n over n plus one. So I think actually I should have said no, I should have realized that. If the top and bottom are both polynomials, the ratio test is going to come out to 1. So don't do it. Um, um, yeah, so... Yes, that is actually true. Top and bottom are both polynomials, the ratio test will come out to 1. Um, so you won't do that. But if one of them has... A, the n is in the power, the ratio test is usually pretty good. Um, and so we can go, let's see, a n plus 1 over a n... So 2 to the n over n plus 1. And this is 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus 1. Now everything's positive anyway, so I can remove my minus my absolute value signs. So let's see, I'll flip that bottom fraction upside down, that becomes n plus 1 over 2 to the n. And I'll just simplify that a little, 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 2. And what I will do is I'll just rearrange things so that my powers are together and my polynomials are together. Like that. And actually, if I'm being very clever, I will cancel out as much stuff as I can cancel out. So look at that, 2 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n. When you divide things that are powers, you subtract the powers. Um, and so most of this 2 to the n will cancel with the n that's there. And so we're just left with 2. Damn, this one's still not going to anyway, it's okay. <laughs> um, and so when I do the limit now, the limit as n goes to infinity of my a n plus 1 over a n is the limit as n goes to infinity of so oh, I don't need this absolute value, sorry the answer I just got the 2 can come out and we can do our classic trick of dividing the top and bottom by n and we're going to get um, 1 And so by the ratio test, it diverges. Because this limit comes out to 2, which is more than 1. So I would actually explicitly point out that this is greater than 1. 
So therefore, my series diverges. One more example. Just to really ram home a particular point that I'm about to make. Oh, oh, um, let's just do a what if. It's always good to do a what if. If this 2 to the n had been on the bottom, then this 2 over at the end would have been on the bottom, it would have come out to a half. And then the half would have been less than 1 and it would have converged. So the location of where the power is will make a difference to whether it converges or diverges. Okay, so the idea is that, um, look, I will actually didn't need to do the ratio test at all for this because um, the terms don't go to zero because 2 to the n is way bigger than n plus 1. Okay, so I didn't need to do the ratio test. I could have actually done the, the, um, just the divergence test, but I wasn't thinking clearly. <laughs> um, yeah. Damn. <laughs> Silly me. But powers, yeah, whatever. Um, sometimes you can be a bit, un a bit unclear as to whether you're allowed to do some of the limit things that you do. Because uh, you go 2 to the n over n plus 1, you can just say, oh, that doesn't, limit doesn't exist. Um, yeah, so anyway, sorry about that. But with the 2 to the n on the bottom, that would have been um, better for me to do it as an example, sorry. Um, yes. Okay. Always good when you get to the end of a problem like that to say, what if I had a similar one but was arranged slightly differently um, to see if you could figure out what to do in that sense. Um, because one thing that kills people in the exams is, is seeing a problem that, that's sort of half familiar but is a, bit, a slight bit different. Um, and you need to forearm yourself for that situation because it can kill you in the exam if you're not used to dealing with that because stressful stress makes it difficult to think clearly um, and so it's much less likely you'll be able to cope with something that's really close to what you're familiar with. Um, so something that's wildly different from anything you've ever seen, you will either just completely not have a clue what to do or because you know it's different, you'll just go, all right, I've never seen this before, I'm going to give it a good crack. But something that's really close to what you've seen, you have a really good chance of doing something you've seen before even though it's not appropriate. Um, so it's good to do the what ifs um, while you're studying. So n equals 1 to infinity of. Let, instead of on the bottom putting n plus 1, let me put an n factorial. Now, n factorial grows way, way faster than 2 to the n does, and so this, the terms do actually go to 0. Um, but also, factorials and powers are really good fodder for the ratio test. Actually, one thing I should point out that if you are going to do the ratio test, you should tell the reader that that's what you're doing. So over here, you should say ratio test and tell the person reading it that that's what you're about to do. It should be obvious from the fact that you've done the an plus 1 over an, but um, it's just good to know Um, that it's good to tell people what you're doing. Basically, it's just good practice. Especially if you actually went through your exam and there were several of these, you could just write ratio test. And even if you never got back to it, um, even if you never got back to that question, you might get like half a, well, a mark for knowing, for writing down that it was a ratio test even if you never got, came back to this question. So it's always also from that perspective good to write it down. So an plus 1 over an. So 2 to the n. I see I always get confused if I don't do the bottom first. <laughs> I'm just going to change the question slightly and put a minus 2 there just so I can show you what happens with negatives. Okay. Right. So do you know what this is, right? I don't need to do the ratio test for this because this is e to the minus 2 except for the 1 there. If this started at 0, it would be e to the minus 2. And so I'm actually 
unless they tell me to use the ratio test, I can say, well, I'll show you that working in a second. But this is just to illustrate how the ratio test works. OK. So let's just have a look at that fraction. OK, so I flip the bottom one up the other way. I still need those absolute value signs because of all these minuses floating everywhere. So you'll notice that the classic thing is going to happen again. If I rearrange this so that my factorials line up and so that my powers line up, Okay. Um, you'll notice the same thing happens again. Um, the minus 2 to the n will cancel with that minus 2 to the n and leave me with a minus 2. Because you know that when you do powers, you subtract the powers. And here's the other trick n plus 1 factorial is the same as n factorial times n plus 1. n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n times n minus 1, right, 1 times 2 times 3 times all the way up to n plus 1. And in order to get to n plus 1, first you have to get to n, which is n factorial. So there's a classic rule which says that you can basically pull the n plus 1 out of the factorial and leave the next number down behind. So you can have n plus 1 times n factorial. So this n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial. And you can do that as many times as you need. Okay? So if I had an n plus 2 factorial, I could go, well, that's the same as n plus 2 factorial. So n plus 2, pull the n plus 2 off, and you're left with an n plus 1 factorial. And you can pull the n plus 1 off again and leave with an n factorial. So you can do it as many times as you need to get them to match so that they cancel. So in, uh, in the end, the, the absolute value will wipe out the minus that's on the 2, and I'm left with 2 on n plus 1. So now the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus 1 over a n is the limit as n goes to infinity of it again, of 2 over n plus 1, which is 0. And 0 is less than 1. Um, never forget that 0 is less than 1. Some people, when they get to an answer of zero, they go, well, what do I do? So actually, zero is a perfectly good number that's less than one. Um, I mean, it's a good practice. Whoa. <laughs> Too close to the microphone, to the speaker. It's a good practice um, to treat zero slightly differently sometimes um, because sometimes things do behave d differently when they're near zero. Um, but for most intents and purposes, zero is just just an ordinary number. Um, yes. Okay, so it converges. Right. I'm just going to point out that alternatively, I could have done this working instead. Or... That there, well, just a second, just a cotton pick a minute, something to the n over n factorial is totally the Maclaurin series for e to the x. Only the Maclaurin series for e to the x starts at zero. So I've got two choices. I could try and shift the n to make it zero. Um, so I could subtract one from here and add one here, but adding one there would give me an n plus 1 factorial, and that's not what the Maclaurin series for e to the x looks like. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, this is the same as adding on the one for zero and taking it off. 
right? So without changing the answer, I could say So I've included the one where n is 0, and then I've also had to take it off. So I haven't actually changed anything. I've just added an extra term here and subtracted it there. And so I get minus 1, because minus 2 to the 0 of 0 factorial is 1, plus e to the minus 2. So it converges. It converges to that. Sweet, <laughs> um, because it's the Mac series for e to the x. Yay! Okay, so you could have done that if you were very clever. Unless, of course, they expressly told you to use the ratio test, and then you should use the ratio test. Um, but you can say this is part. You could even say this is this is part of the Maclaurin series for e to the x, and so therefore it must converge. And that, that's usually enough. But I reckon that if it's going to converge, you might as well say what it converges to. So it converges to 1 over e squared minus 1. Awesome. Beautiful. No. Ratio test does not tell you what the actual answer is. It just tells you that it converges. But to be fair, um, the question didn't ask, you know, most of these questions do not ask you to find what it work converges to. It just says, does it converge? You know, and so we can say, you know. Just to answer the question, it does converge. It converges to that. Beautiful. That's all our tests for convergence, except that there is one other context in which we use a test for convergence, um, and that is when we're looking at a power series. And so I will talk about that now because it uses the same stuff, but I'm going to need a new pencil because the one I have is now down to the stub. <laughs> um, so um, a power series is in a sense an infinite number of series all at once. Try that again. Yeah. So a power series um, is a series, but instead of being just plain numbers and n's, it's also got x's in it. So a power series is still a series. Traditionally, it starts at 0 for a power series. But this a to the n is actually something times x to the n. In fact, it might be something times x minus like that. Okay, so it doesn't just have to have an x to the n, it could be x minus a to the n for some number a. That's a power series. And the idea behind a power series is to be a polynomial. Okay? It, the idea is if it was b n x to the n, it would be a polynomial, but instead of stopping at x to the 5, it just keeps going. Um, and our question is, is that for some values of x, if we pick a particular value x and sub it in, it becomes an ordinary series, okay? because it's just got n's and numbers in it. So if you pick a particular value of x, it becomes an ordinary series, and that ordinary series may or may not represent an actual number. It may or may not converge. And so different x's might make it converge, and other x's might make it diverge, um, and so sometimes it'll converge and sometimes it won't. So there's many ways of thinking about a power series, and one of them um, <coughs> is to think of it as a function. Okay? It's totally a function. If you put x in, it will produce an answer, but sometimes the answer is a number, and sometimes the answer is this does not exist. Okay, so, um, in a way, it's a function where the domain of the function is decided by whether the series converges or not. 
So I often like to think of a power series um, as doing this. So you've got an X and it produces a series, which is an expression with an infinite, with, you know, with a sum in it. And then your series either has converge or diverge, right? So a power series um, has an X, the X produces a series, the series will converge which will make a number, or it will diverge in which case it doesn't mean anything at all. And one of the things that we're interested in is to skip the bit in the middle where we figure out what the series is, and just say directly which X's make it converge and which X's make it diverge. So in a way we're creating a function um, from X to the words converge or diverge. You've got this crazy machine that when you plug it into the mach X into the machine, it spits out the word converge or it spits out the word diverge. Um, and so that's a useful way of thinking about what we're, what we're about to do. Okay? Cool. Right. So there are some series that no matter what X is, it will always converge. Um, like the Maclaurin series for E to the X. And there are some series, like the, um, like the geometric series, where there's a condition on X. It'll only converge if X is less than 1. And it'll diverge if x is greater than or equal to 1. And so that's, that's what we're headed for here. We're headed for statements like that, but just about random series. So we've got some series like the binomial series and the geometric series, which have a statement about, if depending on the value of x, it will converge or diverge. Um, we've got some series like, like e the Taylor-McLaurin series for e to the x, which no matter what x is, it'll always converge. And we've got some random series we're going to figure out well, which category is it in. Okay. And so what we're going to have is that the interval interval convergence is the collection of x's for which it converges. So and I like to think of it like this. Here's my graph. Um, and um, my graph, every x produces either the answer converge or it produces the answer diverge. And so this x here, maybe when x is 0, it produces the answer uh, converge. And maybe when x is 1, it produces the answer converge. And maybe when x is 2, it produces the answer diverge and so on, okay? And so there'll be all these... Um, and in every x, you'll be able to figure out whether it converges or diverges. And the bit that produces converge, that's the interval of convergence. So there's some awesome theory about the interval of convergence, okay? There's some awesome theory about the interval of convergence, and the interval of convergence theory says that the interval of convergence is indeed an interval. It's not just a random collection. You don't get some x's over here and some other x's over here and then some x's a thousand away. It's always a nice little sweet little collection that are all joined together. It's a proper interval. It has a centre and it goes one way and the other way and it's an interval. Um, so the only exception to that is it may only converge at exactly one number. And the only number it converges for is this number a. Because if you sub in x equals a, everything's zero. Um, so it might only converge in the centre it might converge for all possible x's, but otherwise there will be a little zone, which is a little piece of the number line, um, for which it will converge, and that will be an interval. And what that means is, if it converges at two x's, it will must converge at every x in between. No. It, you can't have a bit over here and another bit over here. So the fact that it converges at both of these says that it must converge everywhere in between here. And the fact that it converges at both of these means it must converge everywhere in between here. The fact that it diverges here means that somewhere in the middle it flips over. But the fact that it diverges here means it must diverge for everything out there. Okay? So if it diverges anywhere, then everything above that, um, well, is, it, this could have been the bottom end, in which case it would have been that side. But um, the fact that we know it converges here, it diverges here, it must diverge everywhere over there. And in fact, there has to be a matching one down below where it diverges down there as well. So if you knew in advance that the centre was zero, so 
So if you knew that the centre was zero to begin with, then the fact that it diverges here means that it probably diverges over here too. You do have one um, small problem in that it is possible that if you're right at the edges, it'll converge at one end and not at the other. Okay? So it is possible that what will happen is, is that here maybe at one and a half, it'll converge all the way up to here, but it won't converge there. Something like that. Um, and, but that would mean that down here at the other end, um, it might be that it does converge at this bottom end. Like that. So this bit here in the middle, that's the interval of convergence. And it is possible that it converges at one end but not the other. It might converge at both, it might converge at neither. So that's the interval of convergence. So the fact that it's an interval actually means that there's some really cute questions that a lecturer could conceivably ask. It could say, this series converges at both 0 and 2, does it converge at 1? And you'll say, yes, because the interval of convergence is an interval. It must converge at every point in between any two points where it converges. Um, and that means you don't have to figure out anything, you can just say, yes. An interval that contains both 0 and 2 must contain 1. That's sweet, I love that one. No one's yet asked it in an exam, but I'm just waiting for the day. <laughs> um, so, um, and you also know that if you know what the centre is, um, you know that if it converges at, if you know that the centre is zero and it converges at seven, it will have to converge um, everything up to minus seven. You might not converge at minus seven because it could be the edge of the interval, but everything up to that, so down to that, certainly. Okay, cool. So that is the theory. I have no idea what the proof of that theory is, but it is the truth. Okay, and to figure out the interval of convergence, you do the ratio test. Okay, so that is how you find it. And so there are three parts to doing the interval of convergence. You do the ratio test, you rearrange what you get at the end of the ratio test to produce the interval of convergence, except the endpoints you don't know what to do, and then you're going to have to look at the endpoints separately. And the only way to tell what happens with those endpoints separately is to use one of the other um, rules for convergence. It will usually come out to one that you can just stare at and say, oh, it's the alternating harmonic series. Okay, so you cannot use the, in, the ratio test on the endpoints of the interval of convergence um, because the ratio test, basically, if you do the ratio test, everything inside the interval of convergence will come out as less than one, and everything outside the interval of convergence comes out as more than one, and the edges come out as exactly one. And so it's guaranteed to fail at the edges of the interval of convergence because of precisely how you found it. So let me do an example. I'm just going to look one up. Um, I'll make one up. There we go, this will do. 2 to the n plus 1 x plus 3 to the n over n. Horrifying. Okay, but we do know one thing in advance. The centre of this is minus 3. Okay, so just like when you see a, you know, in, a, in the equation of a circle, x plus 3, um, it really means a minus 3, same deal. We know where the centre of my interval of convergence is, it's at minus 3. That's really useful to know. So it's possible that this will only converge at x equals minus 3. It's possible that it converge for all possible x. But whatever else, if the other possibilities, it'll be minus 3 and it'll go up a bit and it'll go down a bit. Oh, actually, I should point that out. See how this is the centre here? The distance to the edge is the radius. Um, the radius comes from the idea, actually, that the radius is the distance from the centre to the edge. Now, you think of radius in terms of circles, and that's because when you do this with complex numbers, it really will be a circle. <laughs> okay? So, when you do this in the complex numbers, you have, you're not drawing a line, you're drawing a, 
a plane and what you get is a circle and so it really is a radius. Um, okay. So let's try and figure it out. We're going to have to do the ratio test because we have to say, well, for which x's does it converge? Okay? Um, and I can't for every single x compare it to a series that I know. So what I have to do is I have to um, do the ratio test because it's the only one that won't allow, will allow me to do it simultaneously for all the x's at once. Okay, so my ratio test. Now remember that this an is everything, including the x's. Damn, I didn't give myself enough space. All right. It's on the next page, people. <laughs> So I've got 2 to the n plus 1, x plus 3 to the n over n. Oh, that's the bottom, isn't it? So I have to add plus n plus 1 to all of them. Like that. And I'm going to do my trick of flipping the bottom one. Like that. And then again, um, some people can do this all in one go, but I find it easier to arrange every, all the similar pieces next to each other. Like that. Okay. So now that everything's arranged next to each other, I can see that when I subtract the powers here, n plus 2 minus n plus 1 is 2, is 1. And the n over n plus 1 is the same as it was before. There's nothing I can do about that. And n plus 1 minus n is 1. Because I've got, a, I've got the same bottom, and when you do divide things, you subtract the powers. Okay, and so here we are here. Let's deal with our absolute value sign. I can do the absolute value sign separately. The absolute value of 2 is 2. The absolute value of n over n plus 1 is n over n plus 1. But, of course, um, n is a positive number. It starts at 1, so we're all good. And the absolute value of x plus 3, well, I don't know what x is, so x plus 3 could totally be a negative number. So I need to keep the absolute value sign in there. And now I need to do the limit of this. Now here's the thing. This x plus 3 does not involve n. So in terms of this limit, it's really just a plain number. So I can bring it out the front of my limit. And the 2 as well. It always happens that way. <laughs> and the limit of n over n plus 1 is 1. Divide the top and bottom by n, and I'll get 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. But also, you're allowed to just think in your head, oh, well, just a second, like a million over a million plus 1 is totally almost 1. So you think of what happens when n is a really huge number. Or you could do L'Hopital's rule, whatever. So we get this limit here is 1, and so we get 2 mod x plus 3. Now, the thing is... 
Normally at this stage when we did the, the, the ratio test, we would say this is less than one, therefore it converges, or this is greater than one, therefore it diverges, but we still don't know whether this is more or less than one because we don't know what x is. But the whole point of this is to figure out what x would have to be to make it converge. So in order to make it converge, I need to choose the x's that make this answer less than one because they are the ones that make it converge. So I need to say, in order to converge, we need two mod x plus three to be less than one. So we take that final answer and we just declare that it's less than one because what I'm trying to do is find the x's that do make it less than one. And I'm now almost at the end of my road. This is a description of my interval of convergence. I'm saying, let's read this aloud, the absolute value of x plus 3 is less than a half. But there's a different way of reading this aloud. I'm going to rewrite it like this. Now we have the distance between x and minus 3 is a half, less than a half. So my interval of convergence is everything that's within a half of minus 3. So in terms of a picture of what I've created, I've created, here's minus 3, and it, this is a half away from minus 3. That's minus 2.5. And this is minus 3.5. My interval of convergence is here. Everything that is within a half of minus 3. So this is the center, this is the radius. Radius of convergence. Whoop, sorry, that's the radius of convergence there. When you get to the stage where you have absolute value less than something, the number in that spot is the radius. If all you were asked for was the radius of convergence, you would stop there and you would not do anything else. But if what you want is the interval of convergence, we will continue. Okay? So the interval of convergence um, happens at the two end... Um, the issue. We've got all the mid middle of the interval of convergence, we just need to know whether the colour in those circles or not. So I'm going to continue. When you've got an absolute value um, less than something, that's the same as saying that the actual number is between... Uh, wrong number. Is between plus or minus that. Okay, so absolute value less than is the same as thing is between. And so now we're going to... Um, at, subtract 3 from both sides, so we have minus 3.5 and, a half and um, minus 2.5. So this is so far the inside of my interval of convergence. Every x between here and here is guaranteed to converge. Now all I need to do is check the endpoints. So when x is minus 3 and a th half, I know that the ratio test is crap at this point because the ratio test will produce the, precisely the answer 1 at that spot because that's how this whole system is set up. So I can't use the ratio test. I'm going to have to sub this back into the original series and just stare at it in order to tell whether it converges or not. So the original series... If x is minus 3.5, the original series had an x plus 3, and that means that um, this will be minus a half. Okay, add 3 to both sides, we get minus a half. And so therefore my series is is this. Sorry. So I've subbed for x plus 3, I've put in the minus a half. And that'll always happen 
um, you'll actually end up replacing the entire expression that involves the x with minus the interval of convergence and also at the other end with plus the interval of convergence. So let's have a look at this. I'm going to bring that minus that n here inside this power inside this bracket. So I'm going to have 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1 to the n over 2 to the n all over n. And 2 to the n plus 1 divided by 2 to the n is just 2 to the 1 because I subtract the powers. And if I'm very clever I can pull the 2 out the front. And now it's an alternating harmonic series and therefore it converges. So I didn't need to do a test, I just needed to recognise what that series was. At the other end, where x is equal to minus 2.5, that would be imply that x plus 3 would be plus a half, and so my series would become... like that, and by the exactly the same reasoning that we did before, 2 to the n plus 1 times 1 over 2 to the n all over n, that'll just be 2 over n, which is 2 times the harmonic series. So this is the harmonic series, so therefore it diverges. So going back to my original picture, I had this, I had minus 3, minus 2.5 and, and minus 3.5 and, and my interval of convergence so far was like this. When I go back and look, um, here at x equals minus 2.5, it um, diverged, so I leave that uncoloured. Back to over there at x equals minus three and a half, it converged, so I leave that coloured in. And so therefore my interval of convergence is from minus three and a half up to minus two and a half with a round bracket at that end because it doesn't converge at that end. Remember that a, a coloured in dot is a square bracket and a, a not coloured in is a round bracket. So that's my interval of convergence for that crazy series. I do just have a what if for you. There is one situation that will happen where it's slightly different to this. So I just want to say what if so this is just an example for example what if when we were doing our thing I don't care what the original one is, I'm just going to pretend that we got to a particular point in our working. What if we got to this point here? So we've got our limit we've done our working and what if we ended up with one over n at that spot there. Then the limit of this is zero. And so we get which is zero. Well at this stage I was supposed to now say in order to converge expression less than one solve it and we get like mod stuff is that I can't do that. The answer comes out to zero. My mod x plus three has completely vanished. But that's okay. In order to converge, we need this answer to be less than 1, which is always true. So it always converges.
for every possible x. So therefore, the interval of convergence is everything. So that's your sort of double bluff at the end there. Um, um, and actually that means that the radius of convergence is infinity. Um, because I've covered everything. Okay, so I just, just wanted to point out that little, that little thing that might happen. It is just possible that at the end you'll get a time zero here. And if you do get that, that means that um, it always converges and therefore the interval of convergence is everything and the radius of convergence is infinity. Um, and it is also technically possible to get to the situation um, where that limit there um, is infinity. So it is also possible Sorry. What if um, we started with this and we got some work and we got to here, the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n? Going, oh, right, that's infinity. It makes not the slightest difference what x is. This will always be infinity, right? The only situation in which this is going to converge is when x is minus 3 because then it comes out to 0. Okay, so this, like, um, and this limit here doesn't exist because it's infinity. It's of the form infinity. And so then you'll say never converges unless x is the center. And so then you have the interval of convergence is just the number minus 3 and the radius is 0. So there you're double bluffs. It is extremely unlikely for either of those to happen in an exam. Okay? But it is not impossible. Um, I have to say I've never seen this one ever happen in any example anywhere in Maths 1B for in my 10 years of association with it. Um, but it is just possible I think I've seen one that came out to have an infinite radius of convergence. So... <laughs> Yeah, but it's not to say it's not impossible, not to say that it can't happen, <laughs> but uh, it, it, uh, yeah, not to say that it is impossible, it might just happen, but it, it, so it's worth knowing about it. So that's sort of infinite series. Um, I have not talked about Taylor series, um, but I've already gone 15 minutes over when I was planning to, um, and so I will leave the seminar there that does talk about Taylor series. Um, but I have talked about some Maclaurin series that you're supposed to just know. Um, and the binomial series is one of them. I really love the binomial series once I figured it out. Um, so just as a final aside about the binomial series. So the concept is that um, 1 plus x to the half, you can go... 1 plus a half choose 1 x plus a half choose 2 x squared plus a half choose 3 x cubed because that's how it always works. And then you know that a half choose 1 is always a half because ha anything choose 1 is the same number. A half choose 2 will have a 1 times 2 on the bottom and a half times and we'll subtract 1. And so we end up with minus an eighth. And a half choose three is one times two times three on the bottom. We start at a half, we go down by one, and we go down by one again. Uh, three halves. So we end up with this three. Um, yeah. Um, so this three cancels with that one. No, I think I've done something wrong. It is three halves, isn't it? Yeah. Cool. Making sure I've got this right. Um, so we've got, we've got a half 
times a half times three halves times a sixth. That cancels with that to give me a two here. And so we get a sixteenth. And so we actually now have that so far, one plus x to the half is approximately equal to one plus a half x minus an eighth x squared plus a sixteenth of x cubed. And there is more, but that's actually a pretty good approximation for small x's. I mean, it only works when x is less than one anyway, um, but it allows you to approximate um, the square roots of things that are um, quite close, that are close to one anyway. Um, but the decent thing about it is that the square root of anything can be rewritten as a multiple of something that's a square root of less than one. So there's this idea where you can say, well, root um, 26, for example, is the same as um, root 1 plus 25, which is not going to work, okay, because it only works if x is only works if x is less than 1. But if we just pull the 25 out, we get that. And so we get 5 root 1 plus 1 over 25. And now that's 5 1 plus And this can be my x. So it's a very, um, and it's a very neat trick, uh, and and it's one of the things that they show in one of the assignments. Um, but yes, it's a one of the Taylor series you're allowed to just write down. Something like I mean, calculators these days have even more efficient methods of doing things than that. But pretty much when when they first invented them, they do that. But some of, them, some of them, I think, even this is really the best that they can hope for. Um, and plus, you know, a modern computer often wastes quite a bit of its um, computing power because it has so much. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so the statistical program R that they use for calculating things in statistics is really very inefficient. Um, but it doesn't matter because most of the time people don't need it to be very efficient because they can't. A human being can't tell the difference between half a second and three quarters of a second. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's right. And so the big data people, now that big data is famous, the big data people need things to be really efficient. Um, but the most of us mere mortals can use pretty inefficient things. Um, and so Taylor series is one of the first best things that you can do. Yeah.